Uh, today's uh, speaker is uh, my dad, uh, uh, Darren Kuhn, and, uh, and I'm excited to have him uh, here sharing this message uh, with us. Um, I, I, I have, I've been influenced by my dad more than any human on the planet, and so I'm excited to let him share his influence on you guys, and you guys can walk out better for it. Uh, and uh, so anyway, but, um, but he's going to come up here, but before he does, we're going to play a quick video, so go ahead and turn your attention to the screens, all right? Hello, Mr. George. How much you pay for the, for the new ah! line? So, you know, Derek's a little old-fashioned. He still uses a Bible. I'm kind of technologically savvy, so I use an iPad, and he hadn't really caught up yet, but no. Um, I have to call him regularly and say, how do you do... Uh, anyway, the reason I use an iPad is because I can see it better. Um, now, I, before, you know, some days you're that guy, right, you know, that you think you know what you're doing, and suddenly you find out you did not know what you were doing. Um, and some days you just get to sit around and watch other people be that guy. And that's a little better day for most of us. And I today want to just, first of all, thank you guys. Now, for a couple of things, but mainly just for your love and your grace. You guys have been so loving and so graceful with Derek and Mallory and Zoe and Caden and Judah and Micah and my other children, that it feels like anyway, Garrett and Megan, and Sarah and Sam and Kenny, and my favorite of the Huxfords, don't tell anybody this, but Libby. Um, and uh, I thank you so much for loving on those two families, and many more, but those two I know well, how you've loved on them. And I know because it blesses me we get to spend every week with Garrett and Megan and they actually lived in our house for, I don't know, about three weeks or so when they first moved to Winston. And so the kids just think our house is like their vacation home or something. And they get to come over and play a lot and we have a blast. But thank you guys. Thank you, seriously, for loving these people well. You do a phenomenal job of it. And so I can't stand up here and talk about the greatest stories ever told without telling you that you are telling a great story every time that you love on these people. And so keep doing that. So the last shall be first is the way that that um, passage ended. And I love the title that you guys are using, The Greatest Stories Ever Told. And I want you to just go back in your mind, if you've if you got your Bible still open, go back to there. There's a few key phrases in that passage that I want you to think about that as I began to study over this lesson and look at it, there were a few things that kind of hit me differently than, than they've ever hit me before. And one of them is found in verse 7 after you know Jesus goes out even at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and he says to these folks, why are you still standing here? Okay, And, and I kind of want you to hear it with that tone, right? Because tonal language speaks way more than the actual words that you use. And so I can hear the landowner saying, why are you guys still here? And they say, because no one has hired us. And maybe they said that because they didn't want to say, nobody wants us. We're kind of the dregs. We're not really the, the first person that you would want to hire to come work in your vineyard. We're the last people you would want to hire to come into your vineyard. And so the landowner being Jesus says, no, 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 come on. Go to work too. And then he begins to make the payout. And I want you to understand this. This parable, a lot of Jesus' parables are about people. Okay? about one person, an individual, or, or one or two people and the way they relate to each other. This parable is about a group. It's actually a couple of groups, maybe more. But it's about groups of people, and as much as I hate being grouped, okay, I can't stand it. I, I hate people to go, well, you know, he's a white, middle-class, conservative, redneck American 
therefore he da 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 da. Well, I'm some of those things. I, I am, but that doesn't mean that's the totality of who I am. And I promise you, I think differently than most of the other people that fit all of those other criteria, right? And so Jesus is saying, hey, sometimes we get grouped in with people and we may or may not have these traits. But in verse 10, it's, so when it came to those hired first, they, wasn't one guy who went, hey, I'm the leader of this group and I just want to talk to you right now about the amount of money that you're paying us because it doesn't feel fair anymore. It did at six o'clock this morning, but at six o'clock in the evening, it doesn't feel quite so fair. And then he goes on to talk more and then there's another phrase in there that is sneakily rel relevant in today's world. In verse 12, he says, these who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And then this phrase, and you have made them equal to us. This is about equality, right? It's about equality in the kingdom. These are kingdom calculations that, that Jesus is talking about here. And he says, they're upset because I made them equal with others. It thought perhaps they were better than. And no one should be made equal to me if they are not. And that's really the way they feel about this. And so Jesus goes on to, you know, talk to them and say, isn't it okay if I just do what I want with my money? I mean, why are you mad because I'm generous? Why are you upset because I'm loving on them? I'm not loving on them any more than I'm loving on you, but, but you're upset that I'm loving on them equally. And so understand that this parable is not about placement in the kingdom. It's not. It's not really about who's first and about who's last. It's about who's equal. And it's all of us. We're all going through the gate together. We're all entering into the, to the presence of the king together. And we do that every Sunday. We hopefully do that every Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and, and different times. But we're coming in together. And so... It's about equality, but how does one live out this radical equality in today's world? Well, it's by taking on another characteristic of Jesus, and that is loving people unconditionally. Unconditionally. And that means the condition is they're different than me. The condition is they're more sinful than me, perhaps. I, I don't know how that's possible, actually, in my case, but <laughs> some people are, maybe. I don't know. I haven't met one yet. But some people may be different than you. They, they, they vote different than you. They sing different songs. They listen to different music. They watch different TV shows. All sorts of different things that we tend to get upset about when we begin to think about, well, is, am I as holy as or are they as holy as? And hopefully we don't truly think that way out loud. But sometimes, because we do have an enemy who whispers things in our ears, at times, sometimes we may find ourselves there. So I'm going to tell you another story. Greatest stories ever told. This is one of the greatest stories that I know. And it is, I promise, as true as best as I can figure it. Um, I do admit that I might get a couple of things wrong in the story. But you won't know if I did or didn't. And so we're just going to go with it. Um, Lois was a really good woman. <clears throat> she was a wonderful woman married to a wonderful man. Her husband, whose name was Kavanaugh, was an elder in the church. He was the fire chief of a little town. He, he owned his own machine shop, and he owned a lot of land around in different places around West Texas. He had bought the land because he knew that the mineral rights would someday pay off, especially with the types of minerals that are in the ground in West Texas, which is petroleum, oil. And so Kavanaugh bought, or Kavanaugh bought that land knowing that someday these things would, would, would kind of pay off. And Lois was a beauty shop owner in a little town called Winters, Texas. And so 
she was one of the community leaders as well because not many women in that day owned their own beauty shops. This was in around the early 30s, and in 1935, Lois and Kavanaugh had their first child. And because it was their first child, and because she was a girl, they decided to name her, obviously, after her father. Um, and so they called her Cava. Her name was Cavanell, But they called her Cava, and Cava was literally the just the apple of her father's eye. And the stories that Cava would tell later and her sisters and brothers would tell later about their father and how much fun he was. He, he was a boat racer and, and, you know, a cool guy. I mean, he was a fireman and all these different things. And, and so by all stretch of the imagination and all the stories that I've ever heard, Kavanaugh was a really cool guy. But in 1952, Kavanaugh was on his way back from a business meeting, and on his way through Tuscola, Texas, he was tragically killed in a car accident. And Cava, being 17 years old, the oldest of the children, decided what she needed to do was probably quit school and go to work with her mother in the beauty shop. And so she had already gotten her beautician's license by that time and uh, began working full-time and quit school. To work with her mom. And so now mom has Cava and five other children, single mom, six kids, West Texas, tail end of the Dust Bowl days, born and raised and lived through those days out in West Texas. Those were hard days. And then the Second World War and that has ended and the economy is now on its way up and things look like it, it's just awesome and the white picket fence and the American dream and all of those things and your husband dies and now you're a single mom to six kids. It wasn't very long before Cava got married to a guy named John. There were some other things that happened in Cava's life before that happened and they're not necessarily material to this but Cava got married to John, and over the next several years, they had six kids of their own. And you see a pattern. Um, I don't know exactly what happened, but within a few years, John began to kind of get restless and, and not live life quite so Christ-like, if, if you will. And John began to struggle with the law, and he ended up in prison for burglary, and then he got out, and then he ended up in prison again. And, and a few times over the next few years, John is in prison and out of prison. And so now, not only is Lois the mother of six kids, now she's pretty much raised her kids by this time, but now Cava is a single mom, mother of six. And so Lois, who had sold her beauty shop by this time and was trying to retire and become a granny to all of her kids. Y'all are okay with that word? I mean, I know some of y'all use Mimi and Nana and all kinds of other strange things. But, but granny is what we're going with today in, in this story anyway. And so she was ready to become granny to everybody. And that didn't happen quite like that because Cava needed some help. And as many parents slash grandparents do today, they begin to help their children raise their children. And so Lois had sold her beauty shop and she was still working as a beautician and, and then she decided she needed to get another job at night, a second job for a while before she retired. And so she went to work for the Texas State School for Special Children. And so she was a house mother to about 12 special needs kids every night. And that allowed her to get a little bit of sleep, which was helpful. But then in the next day, throughout the week, she would make sure that her grandkids, the six kids of Cavanell and John, got to where they needed to go, and had what they needed, and all of those different things. And I, I guess, you know, you, you kind of got the idea, right? I probably don't need to tell a whole lot many stories about Lois, but I, I'm going to tell you a couple just to give you a little more of her makeup. When she was in her age, with it, she should have been retired. She should have been able to travel around to the places where her 
grandkids live, some of them in Okinawa, some of them in the Philippines, some in, in Hawaii, and others in Italy, and, and others in Oklahoma, and different places around the world, Idaho. She should have been able to travel around and see all of her grandkids in other families, but she really didn't get to do as much of that as she would like. And to be economical, she drove a VW Bug, which was pretty cool for a granny in the 70s, I'm just saying. Um, and so one of the fun things that the kids did was try to see how many of, I think she had maybe 15 grandkids by this time, see how many of those they could get into the VW Bug with her and, and say, Granny, can you take us to the mall, which was just beginning to be a thing back then. And with all of the craziness and laughter that would ensue trying to get 15 kids into a VW bug with a granny. Um, she would start laughing really hard and the kids knew these things might happen and, and so I'll just say that she began to have other issues at that time and sometimes would need to get out of the car and go in and change clothes before the grandkids and her went to the mall. However, that didn't really get her down. She still loved life and enjoyed that, those times and, and laughed about those stories with her grandkids for a long time. When she was in her 70s, she took a glider trip by herself up over the Hawaiian Islands and just enjoyed that. She wasn't scared of very many things. I mean, after all, she had lived through a lot, right? Well, one of the things that began to happen over the years if we go back to John, is the family really wasn't very fond of John. As well, maybe they shouldn't be. But Granny Lois loved John. John was my uncle. And so Granny continued to love on John. Granny was my granny. And over the years, she began to try to teach John the gospel, and he wouldn't listen very much. And he would try again, and she would try again, and she would invite him to church, and he seldom ever came, maybe on Easter and Christmas, you know, the obligatory days. But then, at one time or another, shortly after he finally got out of prison for the last time, he ended up with cancer, and it was fairly aggressive. And so he ends up at MD Anderson Hospital down in Houston, Texas, and Granny Lois would load up her Subaru by this time. Um, she would load up her Subaru, and she would drive the 14 hours round trip from Abilene, Texas, down to Houston, Texas. She would spend the night in John's hotel, or hotel room, in his hospital room, so that she didn't have to pay a hotel bill. And she would just preach the gospel to him, or she would let him listen to tapes of, of somebody else that was preaching the gospel to him. And eventually, John relented. Eventually, Granny Lois got hold of John. And John decided, you know what, I probably do need to change my life. I probably do need to let Jesus do something here. And so this 70-year-old, or roughly in her 70s, little tiny woman went to the people in the hospital there at MD Anderson and said, I need a baptistry. And they said, uh, ma'am, uh, John's got all kinds of open wounds on him. A baptistry might kill him. And she said, I don't care. Um, <clears throat> and so she arranged to have John put in a lift and baptized literally in, in a therapeutic tank. We might call that a baptistry or a cow trough um, today. But in West Texas... It was a little therapy pool that they obviously had to fill up and all of those things, but she made sure and went to the trouble to make that happen. And this woman in her 70s baptized her son-in-law who had pretty much ruined her life and her daughter's life and many of her grandchildren's lives who still suffer today with the kind of dysfunction that is created in that type of environment. And after all, I mean, we kind of get it, don't we? I mean, we understand dysfunction, right? Uh, is there anybody here that's in a totally functional family? <laughs> He's not, I can promise you. So <laughs> he grew up with me. So, I mean, there, that pretty much knocks out all function right there. Lois knew this parable. 
She lived it. She never gave up on it. She knew that even at the end of a person's life, Jesus still had the ability to give them grace and equity in the kingdom of God. And when John got baptized, it was, it was really cool news to some of us. And I, I never heard my parents say really one bad thing about John. My dad was, I mean, he was kind of a Mark Twain type character. Everybody loved him and, and he could converse with anybody from the poorest of the poor to the billionaire. And he didn't really care who you were. And daddy always treated John with the utmost of respect Treated him like a brother-in-law, not a bad one, a good one. My mom always treated him with respect. But some of the aunts and uncles, not so much. And you can imagine why. Their kids missed out on Granny Lois. Maybe they missed out. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know all of the ends and pieces to this story. But I do know this. At one point, I heard a conversation, and I was still a kid, a young teen maybe when this happened, and I heard somebody say, well, you know, it was probably just a deathbed confession. And I, I, prob I think I even remember asking my mom, what, what, what is a deathbed confession? And basically, they, they were saying it was a deathbed confession because it was. But that's not what they meant. What they meant was, he's probably faking it. He probably just did it to get Granny Lois, you know, she's a sweet old woman. You don't want to disappoint her. He probably didn't really mean it. I mean, after all, he didn't have a chance to really repent because he died shortly thereafter. So how is it that a man could, could really have a deathbed confession and really have this difference in his life if, if there's no fruit to bear from it? We can't inspect the fruit. How could it be real? Was kind of the idea. I guess they believed in that. A couple of them even said when he got cancer, well, it's probably karma, as I guess they believed in that sort of thing. Granny didn't know. She believed in love. And so she loved on John, and she kept loving on John, and she kept loving on John, and John eventually came to know Jesus because of her love for him. One of those family members, a few years after that, I was in Abilene visiting my granny, and we were talking about some things, and she was struggling a little bit with grace, oddly enough the woman who pretty much gave up everything and, in my eyes, lived like an angel in order to bless other people's lives, was struggling with grace for herself. You see, she didn't struggle for grace or with grace for John. She knew some of John's sins. She didn't know all of them, but, but that was okay. She could forgive them, and, and she, could, she could ask John to please accept this wonderful gift of grace that, that Jesus has offered to you. But she also knew her own sin, and she struggled a little more with that. Now, again, I can't imagine what that sin might have been. I know she had sin because we all do. But again, she was pretty much an angel in my eyes, in the rest of her grandchildren's eyes. But she struggled with grace for herself, and we began to talk, and one of the conversation points became John. And I was sitting there talking with her, and, and I said, well, Granny, I mean, you, you love John like no one else, and, and, and even to the last minute, and you believe this grace was available for him. Why in the world would you struggle to think that maybe there's not enough grace for you? To which one of my aunts said, well, to be honest, if John's going to be in heaven, I don't know if I want to be. <laughs> And it wasn't his wife. Um, so we sat and talked, and I was kind of taken aback. And I, I believe I was going through seminary at the time, so I was probably the smartest human in the world. And 
I mentioned to her that if she didn't change her attitude, that probably wasn't going to be an issue. Um, now, I don't know if she ever changed her attitude or not. I know she is still alive, and hopefully she won't see this, but <laughs> she is still alive, so maybe God's hanging out waiting. I don't know. I mean, the point is, we can have all kinds of opinions about other people and what they deserve and what they don't deserve, and it really doesn't matter. What matters is what Jesus thinks we deserve. And he's willing to give us what we don't deserve. And he's willing to not give us what we do deserve. And not only is he willing to give it, he's trying to give it away just as fast as he possibly can. Today. And several years after that, Granny had asked me to preach her funeral and I got to do that. And as I was talking to all of her children and her grandchildren out in West Texas and beginning to ask them stories of her life. That, I mean, we celebrated like crazy and we laughed and we praised God for all that she had done in all of our lives. She's the reason Derek is here today. You guys don't know that. But one of those other issues that Kava had was she had a baby out of wedlock before her and John got married. And that baby, in those days, out in West Texas, usually would end up being adopted. And so he was. And Granny didn't know where he went or who he went with, and nobody really did. But Granny knew she could pray for him. And so she started praying before he was born that one of her grandsons, hopefully this one, would become a preacher of the gospel. I don't know if he did, but I know of at least two others who have. And I think there's more in the pipeline because of Granny Lois's prayers. For over 40 years, the day I told her I was going to seminary, she said, I've been praying for you for 40 years, boy. <laughs> don't let me down. Um, she was, she was nicer than that. She probably didn't say it exactly like that, but that's what I thought, and I got it. So as I was beginning to preach her funeral and talk to her about, or talk to the people there about the grace that she finally did begin to understand, even for herself, and, and I talked to them about this struggle that we all have, and, and I, I just asked them the same kind of question I'm going to ask you today is, how in the world could a woman like that struggle with the concept of grace? I mean, she was so good at bestowing it on others. And the reason is, I think you know. Honestly, I think every one of us knows how hard it is to give ourselves grace. Well, we can give grace to somebody else. But whether or not we can give grace to ourselves, well, that, that's a whole other deal. I mean, because we know us. We know what kind of sins we've committed. I promise you, if you know all the sins that I've committed, you'd be running out of this building scared in a hurry. I'm serious. But I got to talk to her kids and her in-laws and her grandkids and their in-laws and the hundred or so people that were in that little church building in West Texas that day and talked to them about the grace that Granny Lois figured out and that she lived by and that she bestowed upon others. She read her Bible every day. Those kids at the nursing home or at the children's home that she was, she called them her kids. Everybody was her kids. I was her kid. Her kids were her kids. Those kids were her kids. And she read the Bible to them every day. And she prayed over them every day. Knowing full well that we were all flawed. But that didn't matter. She was going to love us anyway. Because she understood this parable and many others. And so if you're here this morning or you're watching online and you're thinking, man, I don't know. I, I, just, I just don't know if I can live this Christian life thing. I don't know if I've got what it takes. Or maybe you're here or watching online and you're thinking, no, I got this. I'm, I'm good. I've been, I've been doing the Christian life thing for a while. 
I don't know that either one of those is perfectly true. But Jesus is true. And he's got what it takes. And as I said before, he's trying to give it away as fast as he can. He's trying to deliver it to all of his family, his brothers, his sisters, to his father's children. And unlike death and taxes, which will come someday, if you are waiting for the day that you don't need grace that much in order to come to Jesus, you know, I'm just trying to get it together. Boy, if I could get it together, then man, I, I'd be willing to, I'd be willing to, I'd be willing to trust Jesus a little bit then. That day's not going to come. Because that's not the way grace works. You see, grace is the thing that changes us. According to Titus 2.11, Paul says that the grace of God has appeared to all men, and that grace is what teaches us to say yes to righteousness in this present time and no to ungodliness. It's not that I figure it out and then God gives me the grace. It's that God is giving me the grace that hopefully I will figure it out. And so this morning, if you've been thinking, man, I just, I just don't have it together. John didn't either. Doesn't matter. And that's not cheap grace. That costs the world everything. Costs this kingdom its king. And so if you are here this morning, and, and today's the day, I, I see the baptistry over there. I don't know if there's water in it, but we can put water in it. I promise. And we can take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. And more than we can, He can. Father, I just pray that you would bestow your grace upon us today in a way that is live and relevant, that is without question in our lives, that we can trust. And we know it's not you that struggles with us trusting grace, it's us. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come upon us in a, in a way that would help us to understand grace like we've never understood it before. And to trust that though we may be the 11th hour worker, though we may have come to the kingdom late, that you still value us just like you value Granny Lois and all the ones that came before her. Jesus, thank you for giving us these great stories. I pray that we'll never forget this one. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. So every week, in this church, we celebrate communion, and if you're a guest here, it means that we're communing together and we're communing with God because Jesus actually said, keep doing this until I come back. Remember me and remember my grace. Remember what I've done for you until I come back. And so each week we celebrate communion, and there's tables stationed up here in front and in the back. And when you are ready, you can get out of your seat and go take that, take it back to your seat, and take it as you feel comfortable. And I'm going to pray over us now, and then when I'm done, feel free to come up and partake. Father, we thank you that you have already been communing with us this morning and that you teach us to commune with each other because we are truly all equal. And so, Father, I just pray that you would bless us this morning with the very real and alive presence of Jesus, that he is the body, and so he is here. And Holy Spirit, press upon us, not with a heavy spirit, but with a wonderful spirit of freedom grace this morning 
as we partake of the body and the blood of Jesus.